Malaria. Uh, Fleming Conradson, who usually does this in the election, he says there's always lots of questions about malaria, but actually there's not a really good reason for us to have it uh, with, uh, to explain a lot about malaria here, because it's actually not so water and sanitation related. It's water related because the mosquito breeds in water, and that's the only thing it has to do with water and sanitation, you can say, and hygiene. Yeah. So, yeah, so that's why. So uh, it breathes in water, and then it transmits a parasite to the human when it bites you, and this parasite migrates uh, in your body, and it's, uh, it, uh, it feeds on your red blood cells, and they start to rupture, and that, that's when you get sick from malaria. And the reason why I took it, uh, I'm going to spend just a few minutes on it, it's a very, very serious killer disease still in low and middle income countries, and in Probably in your Tanzania case, there will be malaria that you need to think about. Um, and I asked, why, why is it relevant for environmental engineers? So it's all about this environmental engineering. So planning the agricultural space and uh, managing water bodies, right? That's, that's what you can do. Um, uh, vector control, basically, right? So controlling where this mosquito breeds and how, how many mosquitoes we we, uh, we get produced, you could say. Um, so it's uh, around dams, in irrigation streams, in water puddles, like you said, there's one species of the mosquito that thrives in these uh, hoof prints from cattle. They like these small po pockets of water. Uh, and it's typically around the water streams, big and small, where you have leaking water pipes and standing water. It's all these, all these things you need to design really well so you don't, don't create these uh, bleeding spots for mosquitoes. And it's also this one that relates more to the chemical area of environmental health that we haven't touched at all. But one of the main intervention areas for ma malaria control is of course spraying. You can have uh, indoor and outdoor, so you mean outdoor spraying of, of areas where you, could, uh, where you have breeding sites. Yeah. There's also a big program where you do indoor spraying. Uh, so you spray inside people's houses if you know that there's lots of mosquitoes uh, sitting around in, in houses. Um, and that's of course really, if you imagine that you are a family sitting in your house and there's suddenly these Ebola guys coming in, in these uh, space suits with a chemical uh, tank on their back and they start spraying your house with chemicals. <laughs> it's really, really not a nice thing, is it? Uh, and people get like, very scared. So it's some things that the programs are trying to avoid to do too much because it's very um, intimidating for people. Right? And there are lots of, uh, of people have a high conscious of the damaging effects of, of chemicals on our bodies so people also don't like to have all this chemical stuff inside their houses. So. so malaria control, vector control, you need to think about, uh, especially if you have uh, areas where you have water bodies. right? Trends in malaria, uh, uh, the red ones are the increase in incidence. There's only one spot here. Venezuela, I don't know why. But, uh, um, and here you have on track uh, with a 75% decrease. And here you have 50 to 75% decrease. So you see large part of the world is actually doing quite well with eradicating malaria. It's actually, it's going really well and you know this big uh, Bill and, Bill and Melinda Gates rolled back malaria program. They're really posting millions of dollars each year into um, fighting malaria. So it's it's going it's going well. Uh, there's last part where there's insufficient data to assess the trend whether it's going down or up. Uh, but we know from some parts of, of Africa, Tanzania, actually malaria is uh, going down. And as we've seen it a couple of years now, so it's, we're actually quite sure that malaria is on the decrease in some parts of Africa because of methods and vector control and treatment and so on. Who are at highest risk from for getting malaria? Children under five, always. Pregnant women, always. Malaria mosquitoes bite from dusk, from dusk to dawn, yeah, from evening to morning. So in this skumrings to the so people who are accessing water bodies and spending time outdoor in these times, 
are at high risk for being uh, bitten. Yeah. High altitude areas, the mosquito cannot breathe. It depends on a quite hot temperature, which is curious enough why it vanished from Europe uh, a long time ago because it was too cold. And curiously, it's also the reason why it's coming back now. You have malaria cases in southern Italy now. Uh, <coughs> very sadly. So it's, a, it's actually a disease that maybe we are controlling it in some places, but it's emerging in other places. It's quite strange, but the world is changing. Climate change, like we talked about in the beginning. Sick people, because they have an immune, a poor immune system uh, already. And malaria is actually one of those diseases that you can kind of de uh, develop an immunity towards. So some of my Ghanaian colleagues, they, they still get malaria once, once a year, but it's just like a flu for a week, and then it, they're over it. So they're, they've been exposed so many times now, so they're almost in the way. I, I, I fall dead sick if I get malaria in time. I think the last one I put is, is dengue fever. It's, it's one of the new diseases, and I, I'm not going to say much about them. But dengue fever is interesting because it's not one of those classical tropical diseases. It's actually emerging in a lot of urban spaces in the, in the middle and higher income areas also now. Uh, cities in the United States are now having uh, uh, small epidemics of, uh, of dengue fever. It's also a mosquito. It bites all day long, so it's not like uh, protected. You're not protected if you sleep under a bed net. And there's no treatment, which is a sad thing. And there are different types of dengue. You can get dengue and you can just get a very bad flu, but you can also get hemorrhagic or bleeding fever, and then you, you bleed from different uh, openings and from internal organs, and that you die from. So, so it is actually a quite serious disease, and uh, it's something that, that we need to start to think about uh, if, if we work in these urban spots. Um, um, it, it has, uh, like I said, it has a low mortality, so that's why I think a lot of programs haven't really thought much about dengue fever, because there are not so many people that die from it. But, but we have a very high mortality uh, or mobility, so lots of sickness days, months, you can be sick for months. You feel like, a, I think it's also called break bone fever, because you feel really poor, you feel like all your bones are hurting you when you have this feverish thing. So the only thing you can do is take some paracetamol and, and go to bed and hope that you feel that it's a piece of food. Um, the only thing we can do is to ask environmental engineers to do something about the vector. So vector control is really the only thing we have in the toolbox for doing something about dengue. So it will probably be you in the future uh, that, that will be, some of you will probably be doing dengue, dengue control. So, uh, so you need to control where this mosquito is and where, uh, where it lives and you have to eliminate the breeding spots. And the, the, it's a really clever guy, this small uh, dengue mosquito, because it's, um, it cannot fly so, so far. So what it does is that it, it, uh, it uh, finds a place to live in a small container or a tire, a rubber tire, or a, uh, something uh, inside a truck in some plastic sheets, and then it travels on, in that way. So uh, in that way it spreads quite fast to other areas. Uh, to other places, to other urban areas, to garages with a lot of tires, and then it comes out, hatches, and then it comes out and starts spreading the disease again. And the reason why it likes to be in urban places, do you know why that is? It's because it likes all these small man-made reservoirs that we have created for these fantastic mosquitoes. So a gutter or a, a small jaw filled with water, a small aquarium, or a small puddle in the, a, a drainage that is blocked. Everywhere we can find small dirty potholes of water that will breed. So you have to, when I go around when I travel in Asia, I always empty off these small cans when I found something with stagnant water. Just empty it and get rid of all these small spots where the mosquito can, can breed. Yeah? Um, when you start researching for your cases, these are some, some, some places where you can breed. Uh, WHO homepage is always a good place. You can just tap in the name of the disease and they have a fact sheet for every disease. And then you can read up and check what, uh, what I told you was correct. Um, and, and you can uh, draw maps out and you can ask for the country you're working with, Tanzania or India or... Is it India? Is it Bangladesh? And you can tap on the map and then you can get disease statistics for uh, every country.
and then you can see what kind of diseases you might have in your area. The F diagram, it's the holy grail. Uh, it's, it's very old, like you said, it's, it's the first edition, it's slightly different from this, was drawn in 58. Um, this diagram is a nice and simple way of thinking about these transmission routes that we've been talking about with the diseases. These are for uh, the fecal oral transmission routes, right? So, uh, fecal feces in one, and then uh, ingested by a new host, a human, through the oral pathway. And there are pathways in between here that we can think about when we want to uh, interrupt this transmission group of bacteria, for example, cholera or other diarrheal diseases. And it's good to think with these Fs in the F diagram, because they, that's the different pathways that the bacteria takes. An example where bacteria moves from feces through fluids to foods and to a new host. Through the water, right? Yeah. With an intermediate vector, uh, the snail. And then, but food's not really food, right? But in directly ingested by the humans, they drink the water. How can humans uh, ingest something from feeds? You can say it, go, it goes directly from fields to floors, but it also goes through food. The hookworms, yeah, why field could also be soil, right? The soil transmitted helminths. They move uh, through the, the, from the pieces they are exposed on the, on the soil. And here it would go directly if you step on it, right, and you get infected with worms. So, for example, in uh, Vietnam, there's a lot of vegetable production. So you have all these uh, women standing in the fields all day, uh, fertilizing all these uh, onions or whatever it is, with a fertilizer made of human excreta. Uh, so you have lots of bacteria, lots of diseases, uh, potentially, in the fields. And then when they pick the salad, or the onions, it's on the food. So if you don't wash it carefully, you eat it, you get sick. But food safety here is the issue, right? You can do different things to interrupt this. Don't eat raw food. That's a major, also as a traveler, never ever eat raw food, right? Cook it, uh, something that is cooked or something you have to peel. That's the main rule, right? What can you do here to prevent it moving from fields into the food? Peels where they do. So you don't spray it on top of the leafy vegetables. Yeah. There are actually systems for this. You can have small pipes lying on the, on the soil where you drip irrigate, for example. You know that? So instead of pouring water on top of it, you lay some pipes out with small holes in it so it drips, the water drips on the ground. Yeah. Uh, preventing the fecal material to go onto the fields. That's of course a little bit difficult if you are doing agriculture where you need human feces as fertilizers. Yeah, you com compost the fecal matter to a point where it's uh, safe. And if you think about the, the helmets, they can actually survive for months, even up to years, in uh, places where the growth conditions are optimal. Um, so you can do different things. You can dry it, like you said. You can expose them to sunlight or you can increase the temperature. There's some very <laughs> odd experiments that some of my colleagues in Ghana are doing there, and in Vietnam they're trying to have these compost heaps where they do different things to the, to the material, and then they measure how many eggs are still there, or how many bacteria. So they increase the temperature, or they uh, put uh, lime on to uh, decrease the pH, or they uh, use more or less liquids, and they do different things. So, but uh, so you need to, some guidelines for how to treat fecal matter before it's, it's uh, safe to use. In Vietnam, the guidelines now are is that you have to compost it at least for six months without touching it before it's uh, safe. But you can decrease that time if you, for example, increase temperature. Of course, you could also substitute your fertilizer with something <coughs> chemical, but that costs money, right? So in the places where you have agriculture dependent on human pieces as fertilizer, it's, it's really a smart thing for them because they use their own shit, so to say, and, uh, and to make an income, right? Think of, think of a Danish kindergarten. And uh, the small kids, they have to go to the toilet. So maybe they don't remember to wash their hands after, and then they go out and play with the toys and suddenly you have uh, fecal matter all over the place and uh, you have a lot of diarrhea and 
respiratory infections, they also are uh, moon, uh, moon the fingers. Yeah. So hand washing, I'll come back to it next week when I get back, is a major, 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 major thing. Flies. You heard about a couple of diseases today that move through flies, right? Trachoma, one of the big ones. Uh, so you can prevent flies accessing the feces, which is by sanitation, right? Uh, so if you keep the fecal matter in a closed chamber, in a toilet, you don't have flies. And there are lots of techniques to prevent flies from either coming into the toilet or flying out of the toilet. So. Sanitation really is the one thing that can break the, the transmission loop here. And flies, prevent flies from accessing the food. You have to lock up your food or have screens on the doors or something like this. So the F diagram, use it to remember these pathways that you can break to prevent this, uh, these uh, fecal oral transmission loops.